Welcome to the International School of Tailoring. My name is Reza and this is going to be your 16th lesson of our How to Make a Bespoke Jacket series. In the previous lesson, we constructed the canvas of our jacket. In this lesson, we're going to mark stitch all the panels of our traditional model to get them ready for assembly. Mark stitching is one of the most important and time-consuming parts of tailoring. Whenever we chalk out our pattern on our fabric, we need some way to transfer those chalk lines through both layers and have them visible on both the right and the wrong side of the fabric, and mark stitching does exactly that. The sooner you do it, the better, because faded chalk lines can cause disasters. Now, before we begin, I'm gonna give you a word of caution about mark stitching, and after that, we're gonna do all the panels one by one. You ready? Let's go. Before we mark stitch our panels, there is something very important that I have to explain to you in regards to mark stitching. The quality of your mark stitching is going to be determined by three factors. Factor number one is going to be the quality of your thread. Mark stitching requires a thicker and more fibrous thread than your normal machine thread. Why? because a thicker and more fibrous thread has a better grip into the fabric. So when you're working on your materials, it doesn't go out. And when the mark stitching goes out, then you don't know where you are. So you want them to stay in your fabric for as long as possible. Factor number two is going to be the bite size. What is the bite size? When I flip this over, what you see is a small amount of thread showing. That's because the distance between the needle going in and the needle going out is very short. Here, that distance is a lot bigger. Now, we want to always have a very, very small bite size. Why? Because when we go with our fingers and rub over it, the thread does not come out. The more thread you're showing, the more grip and the easier it comes out. Now, the third factor is going to be how short you trim the remaining threads once you've cut through them. A longer thread, just as I already explained to you, will have more grip and therefore come out a lot easier. Here it's a lot shorter, it's three millimeters actually, that's one eighth of an inch. And so it needs a few more rubs for it to come out, okay? That takes a longer time to come out than the other one that I showed you. So please keep that in mind. Before we start mark stitching our panels, make sure that they are free of wrinkles and creases. Simply run the iron through them to make sure that they are laying nice and flat in front of you. Also, have some sort of a structured setup. So at the moment, on my left hand side, I have all the panels that I'm about to mark stitch. In front of me, which is going to be the middle part of my table, I will do all the mark stitching. And then once I'm done, I'll simply roll up the panel and put it on my right hand side. This is a habit that you need to develop. Don't put one panel in front of you, the other one across the room, the other one in the chair behind you. Have everything in a nice sequence so that you improve your productivity in a very easy way. Also, make sure that you have the right thread. If you've purchased our foundation bundle, not only will you have the same fabric as I have, but included in that bundle will also be your marking thread. Now, if you turn this marking thread over, God, I love this, you'll have a flap that says number five betweens needle. If you fold that over, you'll have two betweens needles there, number five, of course, that you're gonna use for the mark stitching of your panels. Once you've taken them out, simply put them on top of your cotton and have your cotton on your table and work away from it. If, however, you haven't purchased our bundle, don't worry. You can still use a slightly thicker thread, which is a bit more fibrous, so that you have better grip once you've run the thread through the fabric. If you still can't find a thicker and a fluffy thread, still don't worry. You can simply double up your machine thread and then thread your needle and then double your thread again. So every time the needle goes in and out of the fabric, there are four strands of thread going through the fabric and that's gonna give you a little bit of a better grip. So, are you ready? Yes, let's go. Match the edges of your panels and make sure that they are not misaligned. That's very important. When you roll up your fabric, they will move around. If you're working with a velvet or a corduroy, 
please put some pins in them or some very heavy weights on top so that nothing moves as you're mark stitching. Take your needle, thread your needle and double your thread, all right? There isn't really a particular order in which you're going to mark stitch these lines as long as you do it correctly. I'm going to start right on the intersection of the gorge line and the break line and mark stitch my break line. The distance between my stitches is about one inch, that's two and a half centimeters. Not any longer, not any shorter. So once you've run your thread through the fabric, simply cut through each length of thread, thread your needle again and start with the next line. Now remember, you need to make small bites, starting from the top edge of the lapel, moving downwards again with a stitch length of two and a half centimeters, that's one inch. Moving down on the front edge, cut through your thread, and that's going to be the entire procedure for all these lines. So here I am approaching a curve. For a curve, I need to shorten the distance of my stitches so that I have an accurate idea of what the curve looks like. If a stitch goes out and I have big stitch lengths on the curves, I have no idea what the curve looks like and that can be a disaster. So here my stitch length is going to be half an inch. That's 1.2 centimeter. Now don't confuse stitch length with bite size. The bite size is always the same. It's as small as I can make it but the stitch length is the distance between the bites. And so as I continue on a straight line, I can increase my stitch length again. Now notice that here I don't have any slack in the thread. It's simply laying flat on the fabric, whereas here I have some slack. The reason for this is that the distance between the stitches is not long enough for me to have enough thread to cut through, open up, and then cut through again and then have enough thread right on the top side. So you leave a little bit of slack so that by the time you cut through your thread there is plenty of thread for you to open the layers and then cut through them again. Center front line starting at the top, stitch length two and a half centimeters, one inch. So now I'm going to do the neck point and the gorge. It's very important that anytime you have a corner that you mark stitch the corner as a corner. So have your threads go into that point and then again start from that point going away. Don't end up with one mark stitch here and one mark stitch here assuming that you're just going to draw two lines that are going to intersect. Really make clear where that point is going to be. Smaller stitch length because we have a curve. Here we have an intersection. So now I'm going to go right into that point where my previous mark stitching started. If I do that and I turn it over, you'll see a perfect corner like that. That's what you have to do with the corners of your neck point, shoulder point, your outbreast welt, your dart, your pockets, and all the other corners that you have wherever they are applicable. So again, starting from the neck point right where my previous stitch was and if I do that and I turn it over you'll see a perfect corner that's very important you're not just mark stitching for yourself if you're working in a workshop you're also mark stitching for someone else to have clarity about what the pattern is exactly doing so develop that habit shoulder is going to have a lot of friction as you're going to base your shoulder there's going to be a lot of friction so the stitches may come out a lot easier than for example the hem. So you can reduce the stitch length and make sure that you have more stitches in that distance even if it's a straight line. Again starting from the corner when you fold this over you have a perfect corner. I'm emphasizing this because a lot of people miss this and the reason why it's important is that if you don't have these two and for whatever reason these two stitches come out you have no idea where your neck point is going to be or the corner of your shoulder or whatsoever. And so it can end up a little bit lower, a little bit higher, a little bit further out. And depending on what area that is, it can have disastrous consequences. Again, the armhole is going to have a lot of friction. So make sure that you have a little bit more stitches in there to prevent any mistakes. I'm going to do the dart starting right from the top. This is the center line of the dart. I'm, I don't need as many stitches as you think. So one, two, three, 
four, five should be plenty for you to know where to fold the line on. You're going to see that later on. So now we need to make sure that we know where the top point of the dart is. For that, I'm going to run a stitch across. And if I would fold this over, yeah, you have this T corner shape and that tells you exactly where the top point of the dart is. I'm going to do the same for the intake point or the intake line. And I'm going to mark stitch this entire pocket mouth that is going to be cut into later. Front pitch. Here you need a lot more density in your stitch length because you need to get three or four stitches in that short line. So leave a lot of slack. Now underarm seam. We have curves in this seam so we need to have a little bit closer stitch length to know exactly what those curves look like. We don't want to straighten these curves. Front pitch. Now our patch pocket starting right from the top corner. Reduce your stitch length around the corner. The top of our pocket, again, starting right off that corner. And now, hip line. Now maybe you're thinking, is it not a lot more efficient to simply mark stitch all the lines and then cut through them? Well, you can do that. However, when you get to areas where there are multiple lines crossing, sometimes it can get very messy and so you end up not cutting all the lines and when you're then opening up your layers some of them may come out and that's very annoying because once you've cut through your mark stitches and then you're trying to put the layers back together and remark stitch a line you may not have accurate uh, facsimiles let's say through all the layers chest line out breast welt Make sure you get all those four corners right. Before you actually open up your material and cut through the thread, you have to do a check from the other side. Flip your panel over and really go through all the lines and see whether you have got everything mark stitched. So I can tell I forgot to do the first button. There is no mark stitching here. So I have to flip that over and do that. Look at the shoulder line, make sure you have all the corners around the neck point, shoulder point, lapel, you have the intersection of the brake line and the gorge, all the way to the first button. Look at the out breast welt, do you have all the corners, is it clear what the shape is, what the angle is, where your dart starts, where the intake point is, where it ends, where the corner of your pocket is, is the curve really accurately marked, is the front edge curve marked, do you have your chest line, hip line, all of that, okay? And then proceed with the next step that I'm about to show you. But first I have to do the button. Also, another thing, some of you who are perfectionists may think that more stitches means more accuracy. That's a mistake. Mark stitching is there to guide you through the lines of the pattern but it doesn't really contribute to the beauty of the garment. It's a very technical procedure. You want to mark as few stitches as you can, but still keep the lines accurate. So don't end up with like 200 stitches on your brake line or on your front edge. At some point, remember, when the garment is done, you will have to take those stitches out. So not only are you creating more work for yourself by putting tons of extra stitches in there, but also taking them out requires a lot of time. And another important thing is that if you're working in a workshop and you're giving the work to a finisher, if the finisher sees that there are thousands of mark stitches to take out, that finisher is not going to spend most of their time creating beautiful buttonholes for you because they are concerned about the time that they're spending on this garment. So they will have the time on the buttonholes and you'll end up with crappy buttonholes so that they can have the other time for taking out all these bloody stitches. So please keep that in mind. Now, button. Time to cut through our thread. Depending on what types of scissors or shears you're using, make sure that they are very sharp. If they're not sharp and they're blunt, they will simply pull out your stitches and that's not going to be nice. The other thing that you have to be very careful of is to open 
the fabric so that you can see the inside. So you're looking into the opened up layer. Don't open the layers from a direction that you can't see into because that increases the risk of cutting into the fabric. Take your time and enjoy doing this. I'm going to start from the top of the lapel. I'm just going to open up the layers so that I have about six millimeters of thread showing six or seven millimeters that's just under a centimeter by the time i cut right in the middle of them i'll have three millimeters on each side that's very important you do not want to have one millimeter or two millimeters of thread showing because that's going to just go out three millimeters is long enough for it to stay in but not too long for you to get confused of where the actual thread has gone in through the fabric so six to seven millimeters cut through the middle and repeat all the way through. Now, one of the things that I would like to mention is that it's best to open your fabric parallel to the line that you're about to cut into. If, for example, you have a vertical line in front of you and you open the line into the vertical direction, as you're opening your fabrics, one of your threads is going to become very long and the other one at the back of it is going to remain short. And so when you cut, your stitches are going to be cut very inconsistently. However, when you open parallel to the line, you can cut both threads at the same time and at the same length. So just keep that in mind. Once you're done cutting through all the threads, it's time to trim the ones on top to a length of three millimeters. Now, this scissor that I'm using has a curve to it, which is really ideal, because I can really just put this on my fabric. It has round tips, so it doesn't catch the fabric, and I can get really as close as I need to by just simply elevating the angle and changing that. So I can just trim through all the threads very easily. If you're using your traditional scissors with a sharp point or your bigger shears, be very careful because you really don't want the point to catch into the fabric and cut through. So I'm going to cut all these to a length of three millimeters. So once you think you've cut through all these threads and they are trimmed, just lift the panel up like so. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Bring all these together. Don't drop them on the floor. It's just too bad, especially if you're working at home. It will go everywhere. Just collect them with your hand, throw that in the bin, and the remainder you can remove with a lint roller. Then have a look. Did you miss anything? I have in this case. If you have, go back and do some gardening. So once you're done and everything is trimmed, what I would highly advise is you take your iron, ideally a steam iron, and just run some steam through your fabric. That steam is going to open up the fibers of your thread and they will stick into the fabric a lot longer. Once you're done, this is how your panels should look like. Short stitches, not too short, very clear what the line is, really clear what the intersections are, what the corners are, and all the details are readable by whoever is going to be working on it. So now that you're done, simply gently roll this up like so and put it to your right and start with the next panel. In this case, the side body. Now, I'm going to do exactly as I did. Of course, I have less details on this panel, so I'm going to start from the top, do the side seam, do the hem, underarm seam, side line, chest line, hip line, and that's it. Once you're done, flip it over, have a look. Have you missed anything? I've missed the corner here, so I'm gonna do that. Another important thing that I have to mention is that when you gently run your fingers over the fabric, you should not have any bubbles trapped in between your stitches. So, you know, I'm not saying, you know, if you do this, then are you seeing a bubble, yes or no? No, that's not what I mean. As it's laying, there shouldn't be any bubbles trapped between your stitches, because if that happens, 
it means that one of your layers is pushed in while you started to mark stitch the line. As soon as you cut through the threads, that's going to release and so then one panel is bigger than the other. So prevent that. I'm going to do this stitching right here, cut through, trim everything and move over to the back. Now we're going to do the back. Because we have a center vent, we are going to baste the center back right on this line all the way to where our center vent begins. The rest of the lines are going to be mark stitched. So for this line, use the basting thread that you have in your foundation bundle if you've purchased one. And if you don't have it, use a slightly thinner thread than your mark stitching. Thread your needle, make a knot at the end, begin five millimeters or one quarter above your center back line. Fasten on once, twice, and then with a stitch length of one centimeter, that's three eighths, make a running stitch all the way down to the beginning of your vent. One, two, and three times fastening off, cut your thread, and now it's time to mark stitch all the other lines. So we have the back neck, back shoulder, back side, back pitch, top of side seam, side seam itself, hem, the vent fold, the hip line, and the chest line. So once you're done, flip it over and check everything. Back neck, back shoulder, do you have a corner there? Do you have a corner in the shoulder? Back side, top of side seam, back pitch, put a few extra stitches on those shorter lines. Then we have our side seam, all the way to the bottom, here we have our hem, here we have the vent, here we have the hip line, the starting point of the vent, and of course our chest line. So if that's all good and what you have in front of you looks like what I have, then it's time to open up the fabric and cut through the thread. That's the back done, let's roll this up and continue with the top sleeve. Just as we did with all the other panels, we're gonna do the hind arm, the hem, chest line, the top sleeve run, the top pitch, and the front pitch. Here we have a curve, so shorter stitch lengths. Here we have a curve, shorter, slightly shorter stitch lengths. Here you can do longer stitch length, and the same for here, but don't make them too long, of course, don't be lazy. So let's do this. Just a small note, here we have a step and then we have the top sleeve run. You do not need to mark stitch a point into that step. What that step is indicating is that we are going to take a seam allowance from that step, which is going to be a centimeter, that's three eighths, all the way down. So if even if you do want mark stitch right into that corner, it's going to be caught in the seam allowance. So, all you have to do is just the top sleeve run without the step. So, and that's the top sleeve. Again, flip it over, have a look. Hemline, we have a corner right here. Hind arm, then we have our top sleeve run. Chest line, front pitch, top pitch. Time to cut through, trim, steam, and then move on to the under sleeve. That's top sleeve done. Now let's roll this up and do the last panel, which is going to be our under sleeve. Just like we did with the top sleeve, we're going to mark stitch the hind arm, the hem, the chest line, and the under sleeve run. Flip over, have a look. Is everything in place? Do we have all the corners? Do we have a small bite size and all? And if that's the case, then you can cut through, trim, and steam. Before I go ahead and do that, a question that may have been in your mind is, what do I do if I can't get all the edges of my panels to match? There may be times where you've cut something out and whatever you do, you can't just get all these edges to match. In that case, the answer is, where do you not have any inlay and make sure that those edges are perfectly matching? So in this case, we don't have any inlay on the forearm seam. If it's the case that I can't get all the edges to match, then I would first 
match the forearm seam because you know these inlay areas they can move around eventually what matters is the line that we're going to mark stitch but here there is no mark stitching it's just a cut line so match the cut line and try to get the rest as much as you can matching uh, and then begin your mark stitching so i'm going to cut through trim and steam and that would be the end of it that's our undersleeve done let's put it with the rest of the panels and get going whenever you're mark stitching make small bites and when you're done cutting through the thread trim the remaining thread to a length of three millimeters that's one eighth of an inch after that apply some steam to allow the fibers of the thread to expand for better grip anytime you're mark stitching a long straight line you can increase the distance of your stitches a little bit more to speed up your work but if your mark stitching curves or an area where there is going to be friction as you're working on it like the shoulders the armhole the sleeves reduce the distance of your stitching for accuracy now if you're an apprentice and mark stitching is given to you as a responsibility please don't see it as something beneath you it's the perfect opportunity for you to study the lines of that pattern even if you think that the lines of that pattern are bad it's still a study so master it as even some of the most experienced tailors fail to do it correctly now some of you may not have easy access to all the materials that you see me use in these lessons and that can be very annoying if anything whenever you're using different materials because of the behavior of those materials evaluation becomes a struggle and when you're trying to learn something it's very important to have something as a reference that you can compare your work with now for that reason we have assembled two bundles that's four but we have only done two that you can purchase from our website simply click on the link in the description of this video and treat yourself to a bundle my name is Reza this was today's lesson and I look forward to seeing you in the next one take care Thank <music> you.